This is an Itch Your Break production, so sit back and take a break. Hey, you there. Come on, take a break with us. So, what's in store for this break? Let's find out together here on Itch Your Break. Hi, I'm Jonathan Mertz, and thank you for joining me here on Itch Your Break. And before I get into some of the details of today's show, let me remind you to follow us on Twitter at Itch Your Break. You can also subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. So if you're not listening to it on those platforms, please do. And also, please give us a review. But here's the thing. On today's show, it is a show all about food. Something so close to my heart. And we're doing it in this full-length interview with Chef Maria Liberati. It's your break. We'll return right after this. Every year, millions of people travel to the Great Smoky Mountains, Pigeon Forge, and Gatlinburg to get engaged, to have their wedding, honeymoon, or even vacation. Wouldn't it be nice to commemorate these memories with real professional photos? Mountain Escape Photography can capture your family vacation, wedding, or engagement while using the Great Smoky Mountains as a backdrop. We're a Great Smoky Mountains National Park approved vendor, so we can shoot anywhere inside of the park. To see some of our work or to book your session, go to Mountain escapephotography.com Hey, it's Bubba, and I'm here with Mertz. Thank you for letting me take over for a second. Not a problem, Bubba. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, Mertz, you, me and you have been sitting here for a minute, and um, our It's Your Break family has been growing. I said it once before, and uh, thank you very much for, for doing this whole project and getting it start off and starting running, and I'm kind of making it look good. Yeah, whatever. McGrath, how did you get in here? Yeah, I was sitting right across from you the entire time. We all have microphones. He, he's got a point. Yeah, I do. That's why I do my McGrath scrape in the moment. I'll show you on the break podcast. It's a lot better than Bubba's. I don't know about that. Oh, ho- hold on, hold on. If we're going to get into who has the best podcast, it's obviously me. Yeah, whatever. Whatever, Mertz. What do you mean, whatever? Without me, you two would not exist. You do have a point. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You got it this time. Anyways, check us out online at itchyourbreak.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Itch Your Break. And also subscribe to our podcast. Just search Itch Your Break inside of iTunes and you'll see all of our podcasts, whether it's Bubba's, McGripes, or just the normal Itch Your Break. And now, back to Itch Your Break. Welcome to Itch Your Break. Hi, I'm Jonathan Mertz, and today's focus is food, which is, you know, kind of my passion. And if you see me, you know, in real life, you're like, oh yeah, he can eat. But that that is exactly what a lot of our lives are about, is about, you know, those morsels that make you feel so good. And our guest today is the creator of the basic art of Italian cooking, and she is the 2010 Gorman World Award winner. And that is just a slight sample of some of her accomplishments. Joining me now is Chef Maria Liberati. Thank you so much for being on the show and taking this break with us. Well, thank you for having me. So I'm going to ask you several questions during this our little break here that you're joining me with. And it's going to be on food. But before we get into all of the food and the deliciousness, I want to know if it's okay just to get to know who you are. Oh, definitely. Yes. So let's start back from, from the very beginning. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Philadelphia, and, um, you know, I grew up cooking with, because, you know, I was from this big Italian family and extended family, because I, I just have a brother, but, you know, had all these cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents and great aunts and uncles that were here from Italy. So I grew up in this gigantic family in the Italian part of, of Philly, South Philadelphia, and, um and, you know, it was all about cooking since when I was younger. So, so you know, that is, I, I think my life is food, really. Whether I was a cook or not, I still can see my life. I don't know if this makes sense to say, but, I, I, you know, my life is just all about food. It was just, everything is all related to food. 
So, um, but yes, so yes, I grew up in Philly and, um, you know, grew up cooking big Sunday dinners with my family all the time and big holiday dinners. So, yes. You you know, I think most of our lives revolve around food, you know, that because that makes or breaks a day for us, you know? (laughs) Yes, it does. It does. And I didn't realize that, uh, you know, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia had this kind of big Italian culture because you usually associate that a lot with like New York and New Jersey type of areas. But I just didn't realize Philly also had that type of area. Yes. Well, there is actually the Italian market in Philly in South because South Philadelphia was once the hub of, you know, all Italians all came there. And um, there were actually a lot of different ethnic communities. There was in a certain part of South Philadelphia, a Polish community, a German community, a Jewish community, and an Italian community. And But the Italian market in South Philly, actually, if you heard of the Rocky films with Sylvester Stallone, right. that's where he really, that's where, because he was actually part of the time of his life. I know he, he did live in Philly, and uh, that's where he actually started thinking about filming Rocky and ended up piecing it together. In fact, I know of a lot of people that lived down there that used to see him like filming, you know, some footage because he didn't really have all the funding at that time. So it was all shot down at the Italian market, Rocky One. So, but the Italian market at one time was really, really really famous for being able to get these hard to find Italian ingredients that you might not have been able to find in a lot of places in the U S and it was really at one time a really big kind of a tour spot also. So, um, now of course, you know, you can find Italian stuff almost everywhere and there is New York's little Italy and Boston has one and a lot, most of the major cities in the U S do, but that was actually a small but really well-known Italian market there in Philly. That's so yes. cool. Thank you for sharing that. I really didn't really mm-hmm. realize the culture there. That's really cool. Yeah, oh, it is. It is. It's a really interesting uh, history with the Italians there in Philly, yes. So as a kid, what were your passion? Mm-hmm. You know, passions as a kid, and, and and what did you aspire to be as a kid? Well, as a as a child, you know, I was just cooking all all the time. With it was just something we did. So I'm just bringing that up because obviously that's what I do now. But I didn't even think of you know really. In fact, I never thought that was anything. I thought everybody just cooked, and it, you know everybody knew how to cook Italian food. So, but I think I probably when I was a child because I did I was modeling, and that's how I eventually ended up getting into studying cooking because I was in Italy, and that's where I studied the culinary arts. So I aspired to. I I really I loved fashion. I I had uh, my mom's sister, my aunt, who's passed on. She was actually a seamstress, and um, I would sometimes stay with her and, and my cousin, her daughter, a lot. And she really, you know, would get into looking at different patterns for fashions and things. So I really love style and fashion, and I I wanted to to model, and that's what I ended ended up doing. I did um, get into modeling. And as I said, I I ended up modeling. I I did go to uh, Temple University in Philly and was studying to be a, um, actually an interpreter or translator or linguist. So, but I ended up uh, modeling also while I was in college and going back and forth and ended up modeling in Italy. And Lo and behold, I fell in love with the food there and just began studying the culinary arts in Italy. So that's kind of the roundabout way I got into it. Yeah, I mean, that I was going to ask you actually how you made that transition between there, but you, you just told me exactly how you made that transition. And it's so interesting yeah. to just hear how people's lives just, you know, you, you go out and you plan out doing one thing and you end up being, doing something totally different. You know, it, it, and yes, you, and I can tell you, I would have. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was no. going to say. Just, I have to tell you, I would have never thought. I would have never even thought of getting into the culinary arts. You know, I just. I don't even think it was even in my. Even though, as I said, we used to just cook all the time. It was just like a natural thing. You know, we always did that. So. Um, but anyway, yes, so I don't think I ever thought that I would get into the culinary arts. It wasn't a thought that passed through my mind. 
you were brought up in this big Italian family with Italian food, so obviously it's a, it's it's an obvious choice. But why did you ultimately you stick with just kind of featuring Italian food and learning to really master Italian food and cuisine? Well, this, yes. Well, the thing is, um, when I w- went to Italy, I, I had gone there a few times. Like I went there to meet family because we did have a lot of our family was still in Italy and uh, my grandparents like brothers and sisters were still there and then I have a lot of cousins and things like that that we never met so we went there a few times and then I had to go to I I went to model um, in I was actually modeling a room and I ended up just you know I the thing that amazed me was I had a lot of cousins that they weren't professional chefs but the things that, you know, they would invite us over to dinner and they would be, these were college students, you know, and they were cooking and I would be like, oh my God. I mean, it was like cooking. They were cooking like professional chefs. Almost everybody did. It was like the norm there. So I was so amazed by that. And the food there, it's just, it's so real. I guess that's the way to explain it. You know, yes, I ate Italian food here. That's true. But the way that they produce the food there and, you know, um, it, it's just real. It's just real. So it's kind of like you're getting this, you know, your taste buds get are shocked by the the wonderfulness of the, the fresh things that are grown there and everything. You know, their soil is so much more richer there than really it is here. So the, the tastes are truer, and it, it's just hard to explain if you haven't been over there and really tasted the food. So I just really, I just couldn't believe, you know, it was like even, I mean, the food here, I was I was cooking with my family and all was great, but over there it was like, oh, my goodness. It was just, you know, it, it was just indescribable. So I really fell in love with the food, and food actually is somehow – at least in Europe, you know, it's really related to style. You have the colors and, you know, the way that you combine the foods. And food is really a healthy thing over there. I mean, generally as a whole, their foods are fresher. They tend to eat healthier. So it was, you know, it was kind of related, even though I was modeling, it was still kind of related to to what I was doing in a, in a sense. And um, But anyway, so I, I ended up studying at my fa- my family had a, v- a vineyard in the mountains of a region called the Bruto, Um and I ended up studying there, staying there, studying um, the wine making because they made local wines and uh, produced <clears throat> bread in their ovens there, and uh, grew a lot of different products that they would sell. And then another part of my um, my grandparents that people that were related to my grandparents. Actually, my grandparents and a great aunt had a bakery in another part of uh, Italy that I ended up going to and studying th- with the relatives that still had this bakery there. And they produced this really age old bread that it's like a potato bread, but it's real, real dense that they produce. They're known for in that specific region. So, um, I ended up studying there also and uh, studying the cookbook of a, of a great, great aunt that she had, you know, handwritten, which was just so incredible. And um, I, I really fell in love with that. So I ended up studying, you know, going to, to a culinary school in Italy. That's interesting. And you, you, sp- you speak about these fresh foods and all this stuff because people here in, in the States, and I'll say this plainly, uh-huh. uh, for typically uh, most of us aren't aren't always from an Italian type family. So our, our experience yes. of Italian food are some of the major chain stores out there. But yes. we think of you know Italian food as this big pasta galore, but traditionally Italian isn't typically all pasta. No, it's it's not. And um that's the thing also. No, no, it's not all pasta and there's so much, you know, it's not all pasta pizza and meatballs that everybody thinks it is, you know. There's a lot of different different things in the Italian, you know, uh, culinary arts and uh yes, definitely. It's not all it's not all about the pasta and the pizza and the and the meatballs. <laughs> so, what is probably you know, the most common dish in Italy that that most people bring up that isn't pasta based? Well, I, I well the I mean pasta is I would say the most common dish 
is something they call pasta asciutto, which means they call it dry pasta, which is like the, you know, the pasta like that you would get at the supermarket, the dry pasta. And they just put a plain tomato sauce on it. That's like the, you know, that's kind of like our hamburger or something that you just eat. If you want something quick, you just put it together. But as far as something else that's not, you know, pizza, pizza's big here, pizza's there, and pizza's Pizza is really big there, too, obviously, but pizza is real, you know, it's kind of a healthy thing. But the way they make pizza is they actually make it so thin. I mean, it's almost like cracker thin. And it's like this one big, it, it covers one big dish. And you actually, a lot of times you'll just have that that whole pizza to yourself, but it's really thin. It's not like the type of pizza that, you know, they sell at the pizzerias here. Risotto and it is, is also a popular dish, but if you want something that's typical Italian, that's not what we might think of, I would say like a, a bean soup. You know, in Tuscany, they are really into, they're really not into sauce and things like that. They're more into um, bean soups and, and fresh vegetable soups. So that's something that's really Italian that most people don't think of, you know, as as being Italian. It sounds like I would fit in perfectly over there. Of course, you know, one of my guilty pleasures is is actually uh-huh. browning butter and putting some zither cheese with spaghetti. So, you know, instead of uh-huh. just doing just the, the traditional like, you know, red, you know, tomato sauce, those those type of dishes like that that are just a little bit alternative or maybe creating a wine yes. sauce, you know. Those those yes. things are just, you know, to me more appeasing than than the the, uh-huh. the the tomato. So the tomato, uh huh. Yes, and there there are different dishes they do with butter and you know with with butter and garlic. You know, and and mm-hmm. usually that would be in the north. In the south, they might do olive oil and garlic, but in the north, far up north, they'll do the butter with the garlic over you know over the pasta also. So they do use butter, but it's far up north. Uh huh. So when you're going through this and you're 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 teaching everybody uh, some of your stuff because obviously I mentioned that you had the book. You know what are com- some common yes. mistakes that you see people make when it comes to preparing or cooking Italian food? Well, people tend to think that um, that Italians, you know, they think of them as like in, you know garlic. They think of Italian food: garlic, olive oil, you know, uh, hot pepper, and so they think of um, that when they make something the typical Italian thing is to put like a big handful of garlic on something or, you know, gobs and gobs of olive oil. And, um, the, the Italians don't do that because they, their their really philosophy of cooking and it dates back to Leonardo da Vinci who actually influenced the Mediterranean diet. And the way it is today, he just, always said that there has to be a balance in every recipe, like the way he balanced the colors on his canvases. So they believe really the true, you know, root of Italian cooking is really balancing your flavors. So one doesn't overpower the other. And that's why, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but we always say the the actually one of the tricks of Italian cooking is to use the best ingredients. And the other side of the coin of that is, well, if you use the best ingredients, you only need a pinch of this and a pinch of that because you're going to get so much flavor from it. So like olive oil, if you get a really good quality olive oil, you only need, say, a spoonful of that olive oil. You shouldn't be using like a half a cup or, you know, like a it shouldn't look like a, a soup, you know, a soup right. of olive oil. It should just be a spoonful because you should already, you should have that flavor there and maybe one clove of garlic, not, you know, uh, 10 cloves of garlic. And, and the other thing that I do see too is people are sauteing the garlic until it's like really brown, like almost burnt. And that's going to give your dish a, a bitter flavor. So, but yeah, the Italians balance, they balance their, you know, they balance their flavor. So even with cheese, you know. Right. And it, and it's the same thing with tomatoes. If you really overcook them, they become very bitter, acidic, you know, you start pulling it out because all the water's going out, out of it. So definitely, definitely. That's, yep. That's very interesting. So I was sitting here, I was like, you're just like, wow, you're, you know, the, the Da Vinci thing was very cool. And then you mentioned the Mediterranean diet, which 
you know, my doctor has actually mentioned that to me, you know, 10, 15 years ago to, to really start uh-huh. focusing my diet that way. I haven't, I didn't uh-huh. listen to him obviously. And, 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 and I pay for it, but now I'm actually on the reverse. I'm, I'm trying to better myself and, and go through, but here in the news lately, you see the Mediterranean diet everywhere. And it's not actually a diet. It's just a way to prepare your food. And it's, it's not like you're cutting things out. It's just balancing it. Yes, it's not a diet at all, like diet, like you're depriving yourself. No, it's just, it's just a way of eating. And, you know, it kind of fo- follows the Mediterranean way of life. It's just very relaxed. And, you know, so it's not like you're, you know, measuring half a cup of this, a spoon of that or whatever. You're just, you know, it's moderate portions and, um you should be filling your plate with, you know, more fruits and vegetables and nuts. And, you know, when you eat the ch- things like cheese and meats, that should be only a small part, the smallest part of your plate, whereas the beans, the salads, the vegetables, the fruits, that should be like covering a larger part of your plate, so to speak. But you're right. It's not, it's not a diet. It's just, it's just kind of, it really is like a lifestyle, you know, a way to eat. Definitely. So if you were going to recommend an Italian dish for someone to try that's new to cooking or even new to creating Italian dishes, because, you know, everybody does the, the, the typical, you know, boil your pasta, pour the red sauce over it. And and so Uh to me, that's not truly cooking Italian food. If you were going to actually truly make a traditional Italian dish, what would you recommend? Well, if you want something different, you know, to make and, and something, but yet, as you said, somebody's starting to cook and they want something authentic Italian. Um, one of my favorite dishes to make is risotto because it's just so versatile and it's, it's a great dish, but you can also add so many different types of ingredients into it and, um, it's good for you. It's healthy for you. And, you know, there's, you can do it with, like, I, I know I have a uh, a recipe, in fact, we just did something for Valentine's Day. You can actually saute strawberries and make this red risotto, um, or you can just do risotto with um, peas, which is so good, and just a little bit of Parmesan, Parmesan Reggiano cheese on the top. There are so many different dishes to do, so... Risotto, I mean, different ways to do risotto, but if I was going to recommend for somebody to cook something authentic and they don't want to do like a, a pasta, you know, some type of a pasta dish, then I would definitely say to try to try a risotto dish. Um, risotto is really good. You mentioned something that just, that just like, I've never thought about that. Sautéing strawberries. So yes. when you do that, how do you prepare your, your strawberries to sauté? Well, you just slice them thinly. You know, of course, you cut off the hull, and you slice them thinly. And then what you do is, so I'll, I'll give you the recipe. So what you're going to do is, um, you're, when you do a risotto, it's, all, it's always, you know, you add a spoonful of oil to the pan, and then... Um, what you have to do is in another pan, you have to boil a broth because that's the broth you're going to use for the risotto. So it, it has to be hot. So it gives that the risotto its characteristic creamy texture. Because gotcha. the, the, the rice that you're going to use has to be arborio, it's called, or carnaroli rice. These are the rices that are going to get creamy. And you have to cook it with something with this hot liquid so it's either going to be chicken broth or vegetable broth and that's up to you whichever one you want you have to have that boiling on the stove in another pot okay your saute pan you're going to saute as i said about a spoonful of olive oil if you want to add usually there's some kind of an onion type of something added but since it's strawberries i would recommend just getting a couple of leeks because they have a gentler Ah. it's sort of like an onion taste but gentler so you're going to chop those finely and you're going to saute that in the olive oil just until they're maybe like a little golden. And then you're going to put in, if it's for two people, I would say a cup of the rice and you're going to toast that, let that toast. And if you like wine in your cooking, of course, um, the when you cook with wine, it takes out the alcohol and just leaves in the flavor 
but I I love risotto with when you cook that with like a, a champagne or a prosecco or a dry white wine. It's just so good. So then what you're going to do is you're going to pour in about a half of a cup of the the either prosecco or champagne. It should be dry or a white wine, and um, you're going to let the rice absorb that. That's the first liquid you want to put in there because then what happens is, they, as I said, the alcohol burns off. And then you're going to add in, uh, let's see, you're going to add in your strawberries and about three quarters cu- of the cup of the boiling broth. And you have to stir it until all the liquid is absorbed oh. until you add the next three quarters cup of liquid. And you, so you have the strawberries there, of course, the strawberries, because you're cooking this risotto probably for about another 10 minutes. So the strawberries are all going to kind of dissipate and you're going to have this really beautiful, like red, you know, risotto and Parmigiano Reggiano cheese is actually a sweeter, it's got a little sweetness to it. So when your dish is done and you can add the Parmigiano Reggiano cheese on the top and the combination, because strawberries aren't extremely sweet. So especially this time of the year, generally they're not really, you know, extremely sweet. So you have kind of a balance there, but yeah, that's what you do. You just saute them. One, one tip I will tell you is I noticed from a lot of the classes, the cooking classes that I do, people tend to think of, you know, when they make risotto, they, they make it kind of like a rice soup, Mm -hmm. but the trick is that you have to make the liquid get all absorbed by the rice thoroughly before you add more liquid in there. And the idea is you have to time the risotto according to the package directions of that rice that you bought when it, when it's done, when it, you know, let's say it's 18 minutes because it's a typical time frame. Um, that you've been cooking this rice, taste it, see if it's al dente, al dente, you know, kind of like crunchy, if you like it a little al dente, if you like it mushy, you know, see if it's to your liking. If it's not, then you're going to add a little bit more liquid. If it is, then that's perfect. It's done. Take it off the burner, put it on the plate, and then you're going to put some of that Parmigiano Reggiano cheese on the top and it'll get all creamy and you stir it around and oh my gosh, it's so good. That's interesting. So, yes, so that's, but yeah, you want to make sure, and you want to make sure when you take it out to put it on the plates, it's just like this creamy kind of a, of a mixture of rice and, you know, the strawberries and the cheese. Um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be liquidy. It should not resemble a soup at all. So I got a question for you because my mind was thinking here and I was, I, was, I, was, I have certain flavors that I really, really enjoy. And I was uh-huh. wanting, wanting to know your opinion on it. Instead of using leeks, what about fresh chives? Do you think that would be a good replacement yes. as well? Okay. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Yes. And I, you know, I always tell people, I think that, you know, recipes should be a personal thing too, because we're all, everybody's different and everybody is made up, you know, everybody's DNA is different. So everybody for whatever reason you have different, you know, everybody has their own different tastes and likings. So certainly you don't, I I think you're doing a a misservice to yourself. If you, you know, if you get a recipe and it's like, oh, like just for instance, oh, they put onions. I don't really like onions, but I guess I'll add them because that's what the recipe calls for whatever. If you like chives, for instance, try the chives and you're actually making that recipe your own really. So, and I think that's the fun thing to do. You should always try and make the recipe your own. That's what it's all about. You know, cooking should be fun. And there are some places now that are using cooking classes actually as a form of therapy. And I think it really is. So, um, make it, you know, definitely make it fun, but yeah, chives sound great. That's interesting. So I, I just figured I'd ask you that opinion because, I mean, you are yes. one of the professionals out there. So I, I just figured I'd ask yes. that out. And, and asking yes. of a, another professional opinion, do you always recommend pairing wines with Italian food? Well, if, you know, wine, I mean, the purpose of wine, wine actually was created to pair. Well, it was created originally for the military, for Rome. That's how the Romans conquered all of the different places they conquered because they got the towns drunk, so drunk that they couldn't fight them anymore. So that's why it was originally created. But 
through the years, the reason for drinking it, yes, is to actually pair it with food because wine actually, you know, it changes the, comp- the, the flavor of the food that you're drinking it with in a good way. It should be in a good way. And yes, definitely to pair, you know, try and pair the, definitely you want to pair the wines with the food. I think that is really the best way to enjoy a wine is to pair it with a food because it does, you know, it does significantly, it should enhance the flavor of whatever the dish is that you're eating. Definitely. And so Mm -hmm. on on the counterpart of this, if somebody doesn't drink or, you know, wine or alcohol, do you have any recommendations for beverages? Well, if you don't drink wine or alcohol, and hey, that's fine, I um, I would recommend a sparkling, like a sparkling Italian water. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, I don't want to, without mentioning different brands, but there right. are different sparkling waters. And actually, even if you do drink wine, it's really good to, to drink some sparkling water with your meal because it, it acts as a digestive aid. It helps you to digest, really. So, yes, I would recommend just just doing that. If you don't want to drink wine, hey, that's fine. Drink, drink like a sparkling water along with your, with your meal. That's really cool. That is really cool. I want to mm-hmm. change directions just a little bit here. And uh-huh. from, a, from Italian food, still sticking on food, but I want to move a little bit from Italian, yeah. Italian food. I'll move it away a little bit. And outside uh-huh. of Italian food, what is your uh-huh. other favorite food type? Um. I ha- well, outside of Italian food, I would say Chinese food, mm-hmm. and then after that, Indian food. Ooh, yeah. um, because of all the spices and things like that, the Chinese food I like because they are heavily into a lot of vegetables. You know, fresh vegetables. Right. And um, you know, obviously, the thing is to here with. Chinese food, I know like Italian food and, and I've never been to China or whatever, but the people that I know that, that are in the uh, Chinese culinary field have Chinese restaurants, Chinese chefs will tell me that, um, it's, you know, it's not the same here as it is there. And, um, I know that, you know, the typical, the real Chinese food, they, they actually shop for their fresh vegetables every day, just like the Italians do. So it's, it, and I love fresh vegetables. I think they really add an oomph to any dish if it's fresh. So that's why I like Chinese food and Indian food. Um, I like it because there's all these really interesting spices that I've learned about that are so good for you, you know, like the turmeric and, and uh, cumin and all these different spices that they that they do use in their foods that are really good for you. So. Yes, those I think are probably my next two favorites. Those are pretty good favorites there. Of course, I'm I'm, I'm a big, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of of Thai food, so which is not, not Thai food is great too. Yeah, which isn't very far from 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 Chinese, and then of course yes. Mex- Mexican cuisine has always been a big fan of mine too. Um, what is your least favorite food? My least favorite food. Wow, that that's kind of difficult to say, but. Um, I'm not really big on meats, so I would probably say, um, you know, and I, I could say like, but you know, German and Aust- Germany and Austria, I've traveled there and had actually studied some cooking things there. And I can't really say those cultures because they have these wonderful desserts and cakes and mm-hmm. things that are just really good. So I would probably say, um, and I can't say French, although some of their dishes, like, I'm not really big on the real heavy buttery thing. Right. But, you know, obviously there are some great dishes, um, French dishes, so I couldn't say that. So, you know, it would be really hard for me. I mean, I I do like Mexican food also. There's, right. You know, there are certain bits and pieces of different cultures that I really do do enjoy. So I don't know. I think maybe the Russian culture tends to have like lots of meats and heavy meats and things, although they do have lots of things with, you know, um, freshly made vegetables and things as well, like salads and things. Right. So I like that. So it, it would kind of be hard for me, especially being a foodie. I, I really enjoy um, eating or, and and trying different dishes in every culture. Right. It's just not every dish is, you know, 
something that obviously, like anything, that I really do like. But yes, I try Thai food. Vietnamese food is great too. Mm-hmm. And um, and those two, I'm not really familiar with cooking. I've tried those at, at actual um, at at restaurants in New York City. You know, Vietnamese Thai Thai cuisine. I think even in Philly, I did. So I, you know, I there's really I don't know that there's um, of any cuisine that I could think of that I totally don't like at all. Um, I do like different different foods from different cultures, and there's a lot of dishes I've tried. I, I try to learn to cook that are outside of the you know Italian culture, also. Right, and I didn't know if you were just going to try to pinpoint a specific dish, you know, that you really just don't like, or if a you... dish that I don't like. Yeah. Yes, huh? Um, I it would probably have to be something that's really just a lot of meat because I'm gotcha. not a big. I'm not a big meat eater at all. So you're not like all, huge, you know, and, huge and eating a lot of big pot roast and things like that and, and barbecue yes. probably. Yes, barbecue. There you go. Mm. Yep. I don't like any barbecue stuff. <laughs> so I guess I could say that that type of cuisine, like a barbecue, you know, whatever. Mm. And the Italians do do have this big holiday where they barbecue all this stuff. So that's definitely not me. Yeah, the the barbecued stuff I'm I'm really not into. I'm probably more a person that likes the things with rice and pasta and beans and gotcha. you know, so and fresh vegetables like like the some of the things in the cuisines, like even the Mexican cuisine has that, and uh, you know the the different dishes with the different beans and the and the seafood is really good too, um, you know. So yeah, I would say a barbecue like barbecued stuff. I'm not into. It's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. So here's here's a, here's an oddball question for you. If you're to eat uh-huh. fast food, what is your go to and why? Oh gosh, that's really difficult. But, um, <laughs> and I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't I expect did. you to. Yeah, I didn't expect you to be a big fast food eater. But I was just kind of curious yes. to see, as a as well, a chef, what did you pick? Ex- exactly. I I usually try to really like um, research and find out because I've had some bad experiences with even these places that have like salads. Because you know when you travel right. a lot. And you have to eat quickly. So, um, but are, are you talking about, do you want me to tell you the name of an actual place that I would go to? Is that what you want me to tell you? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, or I mean, if you want to, or if so, you just want to say a specific dish, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, well, usually if it's a quick something, generally if I'm going somewhere, if even if I have to make myself like an organic peanut butter and jelly sandwich just so I have something with me and I don't have to eat fast food, if I have the time, I'll take a couple of those with me so mm-hmm. I can just munch on them and fresh fruit. But if I really don't, I'm not able to get anything and I have to just go out the door, um, I, I usually try to find a place, like I like a cappuccino for a snack. So, right. you know, there's some good coffee places that I can grab a cappuccino. And uh, there are some places now that will do things with, because I'll try to get like egg, something with eggs, like an egg white or something like that, an egg white with like vegetables and stuff like that. I I don't, I try not to eat salads out anymore. It just, I, I've had some bad experiences with doing that at fast food places. I think they all are using all kinds of chemicals and everything. So, but I think really uh, people think that, you know, they have to grab like a bag of processed something to get a snack and the quickest snacks are just like fresh fruit. So I generally will bring, like I just grab a whole bunch of fresh fruit. I love seeds like sunflower, uh, raw sunflower seeds, raw pumpkin seeds, um, hard boiled eggs if I have time to do that. Um, I'll get that. And as I said, even like just a peanut butter, old fashioned peanut butter and jelly or peanut butter and apple butter sandwich on, uh, like some type of a good bread, that's quick enough for me to slap together. And then I may just have to get like a quick, like I said, a cappuccino, um, somewhere to, you know, to go along with or to be like a, a good snack. But yeah, it's really hard for me to, uh, to grab stuff. Yogurt is a good quickie thing that I can, you know, just grab anywhere. And, uh, so I, I do, I'll do yogurt, cottage cheese, um, you know, just little cubes of cheese. Sometimes you can get those cheese sticks, those types of things. Yeah. I, I always like to try to throw in curveball questions. So you, that, that's, yeah, that's yeah. kind of cool to hear. 
All right. So you're making me think. Yeah, you're well, really making me think. So I, I like that. I like that. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so before I, I, I got you on here, I did kind of look you up. I looked on your website, saw your blog on there. And of course, uh-huh. I see you do a lot of traveling through your blog. And even you mix some of the yeah. food in on your blog, too. And do you mix the travel and food a lot on some of those blogs? Because I didn't get to read a lot of them, but I got to read a couple here and there. That's that's okay, because there's blogs from like 2006, so it's going to take a long time to read through all that, but yes, I do. I just, in fact, my books are, I, I titled them as culinary travel books, because um, I, I didn't want to just do recipes, because I just felt like there's so much more to food than just a bunch of ingredients being put together. There's like a, a lot of meaning to food, and actually in Italy there is, because there's such a history to a lot of the traditional dishes and actually the ingredients. Some of the ingredients have these long, you know, history. Some of the wines have such a long history, really interesting history. So I try to, in in all of my books, I try to uh, kind of relate the foods to the places. So, um, yes, um and that was actually kind of. I forget what your question was. No, no problem. I was, I was like, do you always mix, yeah. you know, your your, your yeah, food so with your yes, travel? Yes, I do. I do. Yes, I I do. I so I try to make. I try to match. And sometimes it's not even about like I I did a post about Mozart, the composer, um, and I related it to this recipe that I had, and on my blog and. Um, because he liked this town in Italy, and uh, he visited this. He visited a, a couple of towns, like he loved Venice and going to Carnival. But anyway, and um, I got contacted by um, the National Museum of Art in Austria that they were reopening their museum, and they wanted to use my blog post as a digital exhibit, which was really interesting. So I did this blog post on Mozart and this town he visited, but I related it to a recipe that I had and um, you know I, I just think it's always fun to try to somehow relate and, and add you know food to what you're talking about your travels um, I, I added to stories about because my tagline is where food meets art travel and life so I just you know I, I think food is related to much more than than we think and you can relate it to so many you know, so many other things. I don't know about you. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you there, but I don't know about you. uh, But to me, sometimes you can go on a trip and the food on that trip either makes it better or makes it like, Oh, this is an okay trip. Yes, exactly. Well, you know, food actually, food is really a medicine. Food is really medicine. People don't realize it. And food can put you in, this will be a rhyme, but food can, you in a good mood also you know it does it does it does keep you know it can keep you in a good mood it can make you feel good it can make you feel bad also so it it really really is it really is and if you people need to think of it i always say you need to think of food really as a medicine because it can it can make you feel good it can lift your spirits up um if you're eating something that your body really likes it actually is going to make you feel really good and you're absolutely right i could understand why you're saying that and it does the same for me you know if i go somewhere and i'm looking forward to getting whatever you know might be this special thing that i know i can get in this place it's like wow you know and if i get it 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 just totally makes the trip you know it makes the trip 10 times better than i thought it was going to be and if i don't Sometimes it's like, uh, you know, I, I don't really, wasn't real, I'm not really happy um, about that trip. But if I get that specific food, sometimes that does. It does make or break the trip. You're absolutely right. So based off of this thought, if you were going to plan a trip, what is mm-hmm. the your favorite basic food destination? A, a place that's going to have this great food atmosphere that's, that you would always like to go to? Well, it depends on where, you know, like how, where am I traveling nationally, internationally, locally, like in, in say on the East coast. But if it, like I could tell you a couple of different spots. I know New York city is a great spot for being able to get almost any kind of food you could think of. 
so I always, um, for me, it's always fun. Like uh, I always love when I have to be in New York City, just walking the streets because there's so many different types of cuisine that you just, you know, bump into while you're walking around. So New York City is one of my favorite places to travel for food. And, um, of course, I'm based in the Philly area. So even Philadelphia, we have some great pockets of, of uh interesting places for food like even Lancaster the farms the, a lot of the things that come from the farms up there in the pretty much the Amish community there's a lot of really really good food there as well but if I'm traveling internationally I think one of my favorite places that I've traveled to was um the Riviera and and going towards like the south of France and that part of Italy so the south of France and like Monte Carlo and the Riviera and the Riviera combines like it's sort of a combination of cooking from the south of France and Italy because at one time um they were that part of France was actually part of Italy so it's still kind of you know uh, it, they combine the food, so you get a lot of fresh herbs in the south of France and some really great olive oil and just the most wonderful croissants in the morning and this great, you know, these great long loaves of French bread, although it's it's got this Italian influence too, so because there's some Italian things there that uh, Italian dishes and things like that that they combine. So I would say probably, you know, I, I love the trip that I've, the trips that I've done by car along, uh, you know, going to the Riviera. So from uh, Italy to the south of France, I, that's kind of my favorite, favorite places for, uh, for really, really good food. And the city of Rome is great too. There's, there's a lot of good, uh, a good, lots of good street food in Rome, lots and lots of good, you know, by street food, I mean that like informal food, like really good pizza that you can find and uh, chestnuts, roasted chestnuts, like on the street and different kinds of very informal foods that, um, I think are really characteristic of, of, you know, of the city. So, so I would say those are some of my favorite places. That's really interesting to hear. Thank you so much for coming on the show and just really enlightening me about who you are and some of these food topics. Cause I could talk all day about this stuff, but I want you right now to be able to shamelessly plug yourself and to tell people where they could find your book, where they could find more information on you, where your, your website, your social media, whatever you want to take the time and opportunity to tell people where you are and, and, and where they can find you. That's, all your, the, well, basically the stage is yours is what I'm trying to say. Oh, yes. Thank you. So, yes. Well, initially, like everybody can find me on my website and that's at marialiberati.com, M-A-R-I-A-L-I-B-E-R-A-T-I.com. Or you can look up my cookbook series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. And you can also go to the basic art of Italian cooking dot com. Um, you can also find my blog there at MariaLiberati dot com. And I am going to be hosting my own own radio show in Philly on WWDB AM, which will be on my blog also. But um, I'll be hosting my own radio show, and I did do a TV show on PBS, and that's uh, it was just called The Basic Art of Italian Cooking by Maria Liberati, TM with a trademark, and uh, that's online too. And let's see, I'm on Facebook as Chef Maria Liberati. On Twitter, it's Maria Liberati, but it's a capital M for Maria. And uh, let's see what else. LinkedIn is. Uh, Maria Liberati and on Instagram it's just my name again Maria Liberati so you can find me in lots of places and again my oh, in my book series The Basic Art of Italian Cooking if you look that up you can look it up on Amazon but it's also on my website and Kindle uh, you can get the books on Kindle also Maria thank you so much again like I said for coming on the show and and this might be a topic I have to pick back up again because it's really interesting. I'm going to have to think about this, but 
because I can always talk food, and, and Italian is, is is one of my favorite cuisines. So, yeah. Thank you so much um, for coming on the show, and it was such a nice pleasure talking to you. Oh, it was great talking to you too. Thanks again, and yes, anytime, just let me know. I'm ready to talk again. <laughs> This episode of Itch a Break was not a paid advertisement. Follow Jonathan Mertz on Twitter at Jonathan Mertz. That's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-M-E-R-T-Z. Follow Itch Your Break on Twitter at Itch Your Break. Subscribe to the Itch Your Break podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the iHeartRadio app. This episode of Itch Your Break was hosted, announced, engineered, edited, and produced by Jonathan Mertz. And it was recorded and produced at the Spark of Vision Studios. All sound effects and music were purchased through Sound Ideas, Pro Sound Effects, iStock, and Spark of Vision. It's Your Break is owned and distributed by Spark of Vision. Copyright It's Your Break. All rights reserved.